Hello, everybody. Today we're going to talk about a very cool topic, psychobiology, all right? It's really good stuff. Now, I'm going to talk this in, uh, in, in relevance to history of psychology, obviously, uh, but uh, I'm going to really, obviously, this is more of a modern thing than it is historical. I mean, there's historical background here, but this is, we're start, definitely starting to leave the realm of history and enter the realm of present. But of course, the, the realm of present is tomorrow's history. So obviously, it's the, we're starting to end, uh, enter the end of the continuum from ancient philosophy up to modern stuff. So we're going to terminate this uh, up into sociobiology and evolutionary psychology, and um, hopefully anybody that's ever taken any of my other courses has heard many, many times a phrase that goes something like this, you are a caveman living in the modern world, and your body doesn't know what to do, because your body thinks you're still a caveman. So I'll get to some of that when we get into the uh, mismatch theory and whatnot here towards the end. But let me just take it back first and, and start with it, okay? Psychobiology as a definition is the field of study that attempts to explain psychological phenomena in terms of biological foundations. Now, we saw um, in, in a disc, uh, uh, we, we, we know that psychobiology started with very crude things. It started with, um, uh, in fact, it, psychobiology really started in when, uh, back when, um, uh, cannons were first invented, and uh, in there would be war, and these cannons would create just terrible, terrible head injuries on the battlefield, and these these soldiers were dying, and these uh, these physicians are like, well, these guys are dying anyway. Let's poke. Let's see what happens to this dude when I poke him right here, and their arm would go up and down, and it would be like, oh, I guess that part of the brain controls the motor coordination of the arm. And so through these kinds of incredibly crude things, the basic functioning of the brain has been mapped. However, psychobiology has started to move away from this crude stuff, and they move to deeper things, not just uh, you know, controlling parts of the body in a physical sense, but we've started to move into like uh, the, the brain centers for emotions or the brain centers for... Um, uh, uh, controlling urges and impulses and stuff. And so, very fascinating thought about how they're starting to discover... <clears throat> I know, Freud. <coughs> they're starting to discover some of uh, the biology behind what Freud discussed. I still think he's full of shit, all right? And you want to have that discussion, I'll explain why. But they're starting to explore the biology of Freudian theory, okay? Now, psychobiology comes in a lot of... Um, Names: physiological psychology, psychopharmacology, neuropsych, psychophysiology, neuroscience. Cognitive neuroscience is a common one, um, but it, it all depends. And in fact, there's a course at Wesleyan called biological psychology, and it's just a matter of how much, how many parts psychology and how many parts biology and how many parts, um, you know, neurons and how many parts. It's a it's really just a matter of exactly how you, but it's they're very related fields. So uh, some of the earliest work in, in this, I mean, in early modern work, I guess, would be Carl Lashley. And Carl Lashley um, was desperately trying to find something. In effect, he reminds me of the, uh, the remember the original Greek uh, philosophers who were looking for the physis. Remember that? The physis, in other words, the, uh, the uh, original source of everything or something like that. Remember the the most basic element or something, and so Carl Lashley was looking for something like that too. He was looking for the engram, and he figured that that was going to, in some ways, be the building block of what cognition would be all about. That is the biological building block because it was supposed to be the neurophysiological locus of memory and learning. Okay, and so it was supposed to be sort of like that point in the brain. So what Carl Lashley did was kind of interesting, kind of cruel. What he did was um, he took a bunch of rats and he trained them, in fact, here, he trained them to run a maze. Or, in this case, he had them do a, uh, a water maze. It doesn't really matter. They, they, trained, they taught them to do something. And then what he did was he taught them a maze and then he would remove a chunk of their cerebral cortex and then let them recover from surgery and then see if they could solve the maze again. 
And what he found was no matter what part of the brain he removed, no rat lost all memory. And instead, what happened was the amount of memory that the rat lost seemed to be a function of how much brain was taken out, all right, the mass action principle. And it was kind of an odd thing. So he, he came up with this thing called the equipotentiality principle, which was to say that every single part of the brain works equally well in, in memory and learning. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It doesn't work like that. Um, we know a little bit more. We're a little more sophisticated. What happens with the rat is we, well, what we find is that rat that learned the maze, but different parts of the memory of the maze are stored at different points in the brain. And so over here we might have the smell of the maze, and here we might have the sight of the maze, and here's the memory of how the maze smells, and here's the memory of how the muscle movements are required, which muscle movements are required to, to successfully go through it. And so by taking out a chunk of the brain, you're essentially taking out part of the memory. You're not removing the memory, you're just making it a uh, less rich memory. So equipotentiality was wrong, there is no such thing. And there is no such thing as an engram per se. There is no engram. But modern um, modern work has found some interesting things in the hippocampus that uh, they can, well, the hippocampus is sort of the, well, you know what? I'll leave that for your biopsych class. This is history. So then we got Donald Hebb, and Hebb is pretty cool. I like Hebb. Um, his personal story is just crazy. He's uh Apparently, he goes to Dalhousie University up in Canada, and he sucked so bad, he had the worst grade point you could possibly get and still graduate. He manages to get into grad school because his mom knows somebody. He gets in working with Lashley, and his life is set, right? He follows Lashley around. As Lashley moves, he moves. And so, as Lashley rises up the hierarchy, he grows up the hierarchy, and he ends up at, uh, he gets his PhD at Harvard. He ends up working for the Yerkes Primate Lab. I mean, this is some cutting-edge stuff at that time in history in the 1920s, 30s. So he really, he really latched on to the right horse with that one, considering he started out so crap. So here's the thing that, here's what basically Donald Hepp says. The interconnections in, uh, between the neurons and an infant brain are just random, all right? I mean, when a baby's born, there's nothing. And so, uh, as even as, as Jean Piaget would say, the infant is born into a, bu a world of buzzing confusion, all right? I mean, that's some kind of quote from Piaget. That's because, according to Hebb, the interconnections between the neurons are essentially random. And so now, every object we encounter in the world fires a complex package of neurons that he called a cell assembly. And so, when you see a salt shaker right here... <sighs> This is just the area that is active. I don't know why. It just is. When you see a pepper shaker, it's this area that's active. I don't know. Here's when you see peppers. Here's when you see salts. Whatever. Okay? And so a cell assembly is just a series of neurons that are connected to each other when you see salt or pepper. And it's just naturally occurring. Okay? And so then what happens is that um, he refers to, in fact, Hebb's rule. I, I wiped that slide out here. Um, Hebb's rule is this concept that because, as we had just said, right, there's salt, there's pepper, and guess what happens? Because these two cell assemblies are firing at the same time, they connect to each other. They connect. Okay. And so what we find is that, um, in fact, Hebb's rule becomes the statement which really sets up the entire field of, of neuropsychology. And he says, look, Neurons that fire together, wire together. And so, if this is a cell assembly that fires when you see salt, this is when it fires when you see pepper, that because you see them together, and he, he found the neurological basis of the laws of associationism, going all the way back to uh, Aristotle, which obviously were um, enumerated by people such as uh, John Watson. Right? And so, what happens is that... Uh, when these things fire together and wire together, a phase sequence is a temporally integrated series of assembly activities. <laughs> In other words, a stream of thought. When I think salt, pepper automatically arises because of the associations that are formed through Hebb's rule. Very cool stuff. And so, when one component of a phase sequence fires, they all tend to, and then we experience a stream of consciousness very cool thought. We have some biological basis of not just moving an arm, but a stream of consciousness. According to him, childhood learning involves the building up of cell assemblies, because, of course, um, 
The building up of cell assemblies and phase sequences sounds an awful lot like, again, going back to Jean Piaget and his notion that uh, cognitive development uh, is the result of building up of um, um, schemas. Right? So that's interesting stuff. And he says, adult learning, however, is creativity and insight, which is the rearrangement of existing cell assemblies and phase sequences to see new connections. In other words, adult learning is not simple association. Adult learning is more creativity, insight, and wisdom. Okay. A couple of other people that came along was people such as Roger Sperry. Roger Sperry was a neurosurgeon, and um, he had some patients that had incredibly uncontrollable um, seizures. And he, he, he had my aunt to say, I said, what was happening is that um, electrical activity was building one side of the brain and sort of, boom, jumping over to the other side across the, the hippocampus. You see the, or the corpus callosum here, rather. You see, I, I've drawn an image uh, showing the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum connects the left and the right side. And so he said, look, what happens is this electrical charge builds up in one side and it shoots across the corpus callosum, goes to the other side, and it bounces back and forth like a ping pong ball. And he said, look, if we just chop the corpus callosum in half, then what will happen is that uh, when this uh, electrical activity builds up in one side of the brain, it won't really go over to the other side. Okay, So he, he must have had some really desperate patients because he convinces them, look, I'm going to cut your head open and I'm going to split your brain in half. Okay. So the first patient wakes up from this surgery and he says, yeah, sir, how are you feeling today? And this is probably too good to be true, but apparently the patient says, oh, I have a splitting headache. I wish I had a drum rift for that one. A <laughs> splitting headache. <laughs> Whatever. I think it's funny even after all these years. And so what happens is that uh, Sperry's operation was able to reveal all kinds of interesting things to us about was called localization. That even though the left and the right side of your brain uh, map out to each other and have uh, a lot of overlap and similarities, what we find is that they're not exactly the same. All right, that the left side does things that are somewhat different than the right side. I mean, for you and I, what do I care? Since the left and the right side talk to each other, who cares that the left side is more verbal and the right side is more visual spatial? Doesn't mean it's potato potato to me, right? Because Whatever my left hemisphere knows, my right hemisphere knows. But it's interesting to note that the brain does, in fact, localize its functioning. Uh, I already said you, Donald. Hill. All right. So I'm not going to get into the methods of phys uh, the, the physiological methods that are used in biopsychology. But there's a lot. You can do lesions, which would be, uh, you know, cutting a piece of the brain, or electrical physiology, talking about like. Um, electrical impulses and, and stimulating parts of the brain. Neuroimaging, uh, not to be discussed. That's, <laughs> that's not a... Neuroimaging, which would be the simplest thing such as, I'm going to take a picture of your brain and I want you to reach out and grab the ball and we will measure which parts of your brain are active when you do that. All right. But you can also do things like record individual neurons to find out how they fire. You can do brain dissections, all right. Again, some of the earliest works in biopsychology were done by people that really had no intention to, such as um, uh, Paul Broca. Paul Broca uh, had a patient named Tan. This is, again, Paul Broca is, is way back before anybody we talked about here. And Paul Broca had a patient that had a speech problem. He had a brain injury, and uh, all he could say was the word Tan. Tan, Tan, Tan. How are you doing today, sir? Tan, 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 Tan. You know? And when this guy died, uh, Paul Broca does a dissection on the guy's brain. He finds out that area of the brain that has a problem, and he goes, Aha! We're going to call that area Broca's area, and that area is that er the area of the brain that is responsible for the production of speech. And so a lot of different kinds of research techniques have been used to discover this stuff. Okay, And we're getting better and better, by the way, because the, uh, the, 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 uh, the machines are getting better and better, and not just better and better, but uh, cheaper and more um, actually... You, you know, more people can access them, okay? Um, a related field of study, it's actually out there in the realm of biology more than it is in psychology, but uh, Tinbergen, in fact, Tinbergen worked very heavily with John Watson at one point. So this is Nikolai Tinbergen. 
he did some very interesting work. Um, fascinating. But anyway, he, he argued that um, when you look at behavior, you have to pay attention. Now, we're talking animals here. You have to talk about the function of the behavior. How does a behavior impact on the animal's chance of survival and reproduction? All right. What are the stimuli that elicit a response? In other words, how is, you know, what is it that causes it? So are you starting to see some influences? First off, Darwin. Second off, John Wilson. Now, development. How does it change with age? Oh, man, even though this is a biologist, there is an awful lot of psychology. Okay? And then evolutionary history. And did I not promise you I was going to get to that point about uh, you're just a caveman living in, the, in this 21st century and don't know what to do? So you must always consider how a behavior compares with a similar behavior in related species, how it might have arisen through the process of phylogeny. Phylogeny, that's a funky, funky word that might refer to maybe um, evolutionary ancestry or evolutionary history or something like that. And so why did it arise? In other words, you look at the behavior and you got, you got to figure out what it is its function and purpose, but to really understand it, you have to think about in the past, how did this behavior help a caveman to survive? Okay, and not just what is it doing for you, but what did it do for cavemen? Another interesting character that, again, we in psychology, remember psychology is a pretty integrative field, and we find um, uh, 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 what am I? Edward Wilson here, who really is an entomologist. He studies ants, for goodness sake. And um, he actually came up with a fascinating study called Sociobiology, in which you attempt to explain complex uh, social behavior in terms of evolutionary theory. And so it's an attempt to explain all kinds of things and very incredibly powerful things like cooperation in terms of how it helped ancestral ancestors to survive. Okay? And so all of a sudden, he basically has as his, uh, his phrase here, Look at this. Organisms will choose that course of action which will increase the probability that copies of its genes will be perpetuated in the future generations. Pretty funky. But essentially what he did was he changed the entire discussion of evolutionary thinking and he moved it away from um, survival of the organism and turned it into survival of the genetics which code for behaviors. And so we find that certain behaviors that make no sense from an evolutionary perspective, such as altruism. Altruism is sort of like um, um, selfish sacrifice or something. So from a purely selfish sacrificial perspective, I mean, a mother should never ever put herself in harm's way, even to protect her own children. I mean, that's stupid from a purely evolutionary perspective. But what happens is the the genetics that codes for mom protecting infant has this has this as its uh, result. If a mother protects her infants and dies in the process, those infants will also have that genetic material which codes for protecting infants, and it will survive. And so, mom might die, but she has in the process saved three of her own children who will also have that same behavior. And so it's a really a fascinating idea that evolution is not about survival of the individual organism, but survival of the genetic material that codes for different behaviors. Okay. Didn't I say that? I did. No, here. I was on the last slide. Here. Adaptation. No, 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 no. I don't want to say that one. I see my clock. All right. Noam Chomsky had an interesting uh, little layout. And again, he was a linguist. All right. Again, he's not a psychologist, but yet we look at him because he, again, talking about the evolution of language, and he argues that human beings have wired in structures for language, that there are, there are elements of language that are common across all languages across the planet. And these elements of language that are in common in every single language around the world do not, in fact, have to be learned, and in fact, they are just automatically born that way. And so, again, he's going to be talking about the shared genetic ancestry that evolution has given us, creates biological structures that helped our, 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 our four, forefathers, whatever, what a sexist statement, our foremothers, is that a word? Made it up. All right, and so finally, I have one last slide here about... Um, uh, what's his name? Thomas something. I can't remember this guy's name. Thomas. I see Thomas in the corner. 
and I do not remember his name. I guess it doesn't terribly much matter. But anyway, um, Thomas something, he pioneered one of the newest ways to study about biopsychology. And in fact, instead of biopsychology, he calls it behavioral genetics. And what he does is he looks at uh, different uh, different uh, relatives of uh, the relatives of varying degrees of genetic relatedness and looking at the similarities in them. And so he finds, say, for example, that um, mother uh, parents and children more closely resemble grandparents and children. Okay, so it's kind of like a you know degrees of separation kind of a thing. But he, he created what they call the gold standard of behavioral genetics. And he, he pioneered the idea of finding uh, identical twins that were born and then sent to adoptive homes in separate places. So identical twins separated at birth. And so then he, he took this idea of finding these twins, reuniting them, and finding out how similar they were. Okay, So they have the exact same genetics, but they've been separated for life, and what's going to help them? And it's, it's been an interesting ride, I'll tell you. This ride is far from over, okay, because we are now discovering, as I said at the beginning, our techniques are getting better and better and better, and we're getting more and more appreciation. The more we understand the brain, the more we're becoming to appreciate that whether you want to believe it or not, you are, I mean, you are your brain, right? You are the product of your brain. There is nothing that you do that does not first come out of your brain. Nothing you feel, nothing you see, nothing you do that does not first come from your brain. So I'll, I'll repeat before I run, uh, hit the stop button. We're, we're not exactly, in, though this is historical up to this point here, what I've discussed, clearly this is also the future. This is the way we're going now, and this is where all research is going. So if you're interested, look for the biological psychology class. It is a fascinating course. All right. See you next time.